Hello, I am Ian Solomon, Dean of the Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy at the University of Virginia. Thank you for tuning in to Grounds to Listen, a podcast where we have conversations with leaders, scholars, changemakers about their experience with crossing boundaries in our diverse and divided world to pursue the common good. I'm thrilled today to be joined by two leaders of Virginia state politics for many decades. Bill Howell was first elected to the Virginia House of Delegates in 1987, and he was sworn in as Speaker of the House in 2003. Bill, a Republican, served as Speaker of the House until his retirement in early 2018. Bill earned his law degree from the UVA School of Law and his bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Richmond. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. It's great to be here. We're also joined by David Toscano, who served on the Charlottesville City Council from 1990 to 2002 and the Virginia House of Delegates from 2006 to 2020. David, a Democrat, was the minority leader in the House of Delegates from 2011 to 2018. David is also a graduate of the UVA Law School. He received his bachelor's degree from Colgate University and a doctorate in sociology from Boston College. Welcome, David. Great to be here. Thanks. It's great to have you both. Wonderful to have you both here on UVA Grounds today. Thank you for being a part of our public Baton Hour event with the Center for Effective Lawmaking earlier this afternoon, and for agreeing to join this recorded conversation for the broader Baton community around the world. So Bill, I'd like to direct the first question to you. Would you tell us how you got into politics? What motivated you? What were your first steps? Uh, that, that's a great question. I grew up uh, inside the Beltway before the Beltway was built around uh, in Washington. And most of the people that my folks knew worked for the government, or my, in my dad's case, he worked for the World Bank, but they had different kind of public service jobs. And it sort of became uh, at the dinner time table, we talk about what's happening in politics, what's happening here and there. So I've kind of always had an interest. Um, when I got married, uh, my wife, who had grown up in Chevy Chase, Maryland, on the other side of Washington, uh, had the same background. She was a she she was a, a, a fierce uh, politician, <laughs> politician's wife, I guess. And uh, we would we would help at uh, fundraisers for people running for something. And we've got to know people, but I was never I never thought of running. And all of a sudden, the guy who uh, was my delegate in the House of Delegates had moved out of a district, couldn't run for re-election. And I'd like to tell you that a whole host of people came to me and said, Bill, we want to run. But uh, they didn't. But I, I ran anyway. My wife and I talked about it, prayed about it, and ran, and uh, won. And uh, it's been the best decision I've ever made. I really, really have enjoyed it. Fantastic. So you ran and won your first race. Yes. Yeah. Was it a hard race? Uh, well, you always think they're hard. Uh, turns out it wasn't. It was a three-way race. <laughs> and were, I had a had, had a one of the, one of the guys who was running was uh, kind of strange. And I'll tell a quick story about that. If you want. He ran for something every two years. He ran for the out for board of supervisors a couple times, and unfortunately, it was my turn with him. And he so he's running against me, and he had a a big uh, I, he called we call it the Fagan mobile, a big Cadillac with one of these sandwich uh, things on top of the car that would say Fagan for whatever he was running for at that time. <laughs> and and so you could always see when he was around and, and he we were somewhere together. And he, he, thought, he called me little buddy. He said, little buddy, I got a bone to pick with you. I said, well, what's the trouble out? He said, well, the other day I was driving up to Fauquier, I was part of the district, and this car with a howl of bumper sticker on passed me and they gave me the finger. And I said, Al, what do you want me to do? Send a note out to everybody that's got a got a bumper sticker and don't be giving Al the finger. <laughs> and he said, Listen, little buddy, I can play rough if you want to play rough. <laughs> so that was my first my first uh, uh, involvement in, in elected uh, thing. But but the but the ran, the uh, uh, the three way race went well. I won and um, uh, never looked back. Fantastic. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. We're, we're going to come back to some, hear more stories about that, but let's turn to David now. Same question to you. How did you get involved in politics? Well, it is interesting. The people who run for office these days often are motivated because they have a specific issue they want to explore, or uh, and 
it was a little bit different when I got involved. You know, I was kind of like, say I was a child of the 60s in some sense. I grew up during, right after the Civil Rights Movement, right into the intensity of the Vietnam War. And I wanted to change the world. And initially, I went on to grad school to think that I could do it by teaching people. And then I came to Charlottesville, uh, and I volunteered for a couple of boards and commissions. And I looked at the city council, and I looked at the decisions they were making, and I said, well, you know, I could do as good as they're doing. So I offered myself up. And at the time, it's hard to believe now, but Charlottesville was a swing city. It was, it, Republicans had generally been elected to the city council. I wasn't expected to win, but I knocked on enough doors that I, I beat the incumbent, and I did win. Now, now Charlottesville is probably one of the most relentlessly democratic cities in the entire country. In fact, there was a ranking re recently that uh, placed Charlottesville and San Francisco at number six in terms of the percentage of people voting for Democratic wows. Wow, I want to find that So that has changed <coughs> dramatically since I got elected. So I served on the city council for 12 years. It was probably four years too long and was mayor. And I had retired. Uh, and Mitch Van Uries, who had been in the General Assembly for 24 years, he'd been there an awfully long time, he decided to step down. And I said, well, this is something that would be a different challenge. It could really have an impact on the state policies. And so I ran, I won in a three-way primary. And by that time, a Republican, a Republican running in the, for the state uh, house would really was a, at a disadvantage. From this district. Yeah, from this district. So I was elected with, I don't know, 80% of the vote, and re-elected and re-elected and re-elected at one primary challenge and retired in 2020. You worked together for many years in the House of Delegates uh, on opposite sides of the aisle, but forced to work together to get things done. How would you describe working with the other? How would you describe each other? I, I thought David was, uh, was great. Um, I had worked with, I guess, one other minority leader. Uh, he, he, he was a nice enough guy, too, but David was... You, you, could, you could see that his word was his bond. He could trust him. He wanted to get things done. And you know, you've heard us tell the story, I guess, before about the uh, the tax increase. The tax increase. Yeah, and and how uh, I I got in a fair amount of trouble with my caucus for pushing it, and I couldn't get it. Wouldn't have passed without David uh, and Democrats helping us. Uh, and that was great. I wish you knew more of that today. So this is a tax push through to fund transportation. transportation yeah, it's a big, it, it, it was more than just a tax increase. It was the way we tax. It was a lot of different things. It was a very broad, sweeping uh, piece of legislation, which you can see the benefits of today. There's a lot of building going on now that you can point the finger and say, well, it was that thing that... Uh, David Toscano passed. It was, <laughs> but that's a really needed Democratic support. Yes, yes. As majority, as the Republican majority, they need the Democratic support to get that bill passed. Yes, in both the House and the Senate. And um, it was it was a, a, a good example of how government all worked. And, you know, anything really significant at the statewide level usually involves a bipartisan approach. Not always. I mean, you have states where. It's 70% Democratic or 70% Republican. But, you know, you always have people out on the fringes and they're not going to want to vote for anything. So you got to find the center where you're going to be able to get things done. This transportation bill was a classic example of that. Uh, we lost a number of votes on the Republican side. We lost a bunch of votes on the Democratic side. But the, but the center helped. And the center was able to push through a legislation that allowed regional taxation, that wouldn't necessarily affect us, but also some statewide taxation that increased the revenues so that we could build more roads and maintain them. Uh, in terms of my statements about Bill, I mean, I'd use two words, principled and integrity. And I'll tell, I'll give you an example of how this is the case. Uh, 
we had this situation, we had redistricted uh, in 2011, and we had this situation where uh, there was a bill introduced in the House to just modestly change a couple of lines in a couple of districts, a technical fix to the former line drawings that we had. The bill passed out of the House, went over to the Senate, and that's where the shenanigans occurred because that hit the Senate floor on the day that Barack Obama was having his second inaugural. And one of the prominent African-Americans in the Senate decided he was going to go to Washington to witness this. While that happened, the Senate Republicans pulled a major fast one and they put on top of this bill as an amendment a total restructuring of all of the lines around the state designed to give them a majority for the next decade. They passed that bill out of the Senate and it came back to the House. The problem with the bill is we've got these rules in the House. People don't, never heard this word maybe. They're called germaneness rules where the bill has to, to really relate to the original bill. It can't go beyond what the original bill was intended to do. And is there a parliamentarian that polices that for you? Or? The parliamentarian really is the Speaker of the House. Whatever, whatever the Speaker rules is going to be the rule unless you vote to overturn the rule. Uh, and so all of us knew that this was classically not germane. But we also know that Bill Howell was right in the middle of a firestorm because he had a lot of Republicans telling him, you've got to say that this is okay for us to vote on because we'll pass it and it'll become the law. And the, the Democrats will be toast for a decade. Well, so Bill, you must have heard a lot of pressure at that moment. It was, yeah, it was. But you know, David's point is it was the right thing to do. You, know, you, just, you couldn't do the other thing. And I, I, I really uh, love Virginia, and I love her government, and I think the House of Delegates is, a, is just the nicest, the best place in the world, and you couldn't defame it with something like that. Uh, so it, it, it took a little while. I was trying to work a deal out with the Senate Republicans and the Senate Democrats to come up with something so we didn't have to take this vote, um, but uh, they, they couldn't come to it, so finally after about a week of them and hard, we... He said, that's not, it's not germane. Yeah, but the thing I didn't like is that I wanted to make the most questioning and germaneness of the issue, and he called on a Republican to do it. He <laughs> wouldn't give me the satisfaction. But but he is clear that he had, he had really thought about it, prayed about it. He issued a big statement about it, and uh, it is a really good statement about the importance of the institution and how the in institutional norms function to preserve our democratic uh, uh, values. And then he said, yeah, it's not to remain, and the bill went out the window. That's the kind of thing that we need to see more of. I was telling Bill the other day, I, I saw in Ohio, you know, Ohio passed the, 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 the citizen initiative on, on, re, on, um, on abortion. And the week after that happened, a Republican legislator introduced a bill that would have stripped the courts in Ohio from the ability to make any determinations about abortion. And the Republican speaker, to his credit, said, this is an absolutely ridiculous bill. We're not even going to take it up. And they threw it out. So, you know, there are examples like that out there where people, quote, do the right thing. And this was one case. And David, I did tell you that if they ever did it again, you could make the motion. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the, the importance of protecting institutions. Um, yes and making sure institutions do the right thing because one year you're in the majority, someday you're going to be in the minority. How do you make sure the, uh, there's a level playing field regardless of which side has the temporary majority? Unless we think we can get permanent majorities in this country and, and, and democracy will have a short lifespan. I don't think leadership, leadership thinks all that way all the time, but clearly it's the case. I mean, uh, it, you know, you start going down, it becomes a, you know, whirlpool that becomes a cesspool that drags you right in. And if you keep doing things to just keep the other party out that are arbitrary, they backfire. People do not forget. To what extent is mentioned earlier, David, about how Charlottesville used to be a swing city 
and no longer is. How much has gerrymandering or other process changes to districts affect the ability of playing to the middle, preserving the institution? Because you're gonna get primaried out if you don't toe some extreme party line. You wanna take that, please? Yeah, I think uh, I think Charlottesville is just indicative of what's happened all across Virginia. I think Virginia's changing. It's not the red sea, the state it used to be, and it's, I don't think it's purple. It's, uh, if you look at places like Loud, Fairfax, and Prince Wayne, we used to own those committees, and we don't anymore. And I think just the population is, is changing. Um, I, I, is it changing in a balanced way, or is it changing by, by zip code? By zip code, is more is more extreme. Um, well, it, it's not happening in Southside Virginia or, or Southwest Virginia, but in the, in the suburban areas, it's really, really uh, been been uh, pretty evident. And I, and I really do. Uh, I think a big part of that, in fact, one hundred percent of it, is is was Donald Trump's election um, when he. He was elected in the election that fall. We lost 17 seats in the House. And then the next cycle, we lost control of the House. And I really do think that a lot of that uh, is just the anger and the disappointment and the dislike of, of President Trump. And we're going to take it out on somebody. And they did. And in Northern Virginia, I think there was more antipathy to Trump than, than almost any other place in the country. Yeah. Because he was going after federal employees. He was going after the, the so-called swamp. A lot of those people who live and work in Northern Virginia or have relatives there. I'll, I'll never forget, I, I did two elections during the Trump uh, campaign where I was the Democratic leader. We would do polling in all these races. The first year... Trump was showing up as a, a strong motivator for our vote to get out, but we had to have at least one more issue that could speak to people. By the second time, it was all Trump, and that's what got us to 17 seats. Yeah. It wasn't so much that people said, oh, the Democrats are good on this, good on this, good on this. It was a reaction to Trump. And I think that's still in play in Virginia. Oh, yeah. And if Trump runs this fall, the congressional delegation in Virginia is not going to look very red. I don't think. I, I think you're right. So, um, so one of the things about the two of you that's really interesting, both served as representatives of your other districts, but also party leaders. And that must have put you in, in conflict sometimes when what was needed in Charlottesville or what you needed to hold your coalition together. Um, or, you know, your case, Bill. Talk, can you talk about that, the tension of being both a party leader and a representative at the same time? We never had that real problem uh, from positions that I took being contrary to what my, my constituents wanted. I was saying earlier, uh, on the, uh, I've always, always had been sort of an opponent of, of uh, gambling. And I know that there were constituents of mine, because they called me, who were in favor of gambling. But, but I just didn't think it was the right thing. Still don't think it's the right thing to do. It's hard to see it being done so. so. It, it, you, know, you always had some fissures in your caucus. And i just give you an example. Let's take gun rights, right? Um, my community, you know, is about anti-gun as, as any community you get. But I also had to try to get people elected in Loudoun County and some, some suburban and, and have actually rural areas where guns are a way of life. It's part of the culture, and you have to soft pedal it. And when some of these got, folks got elected, they're saying to their Northern Virginia colleagues who want to enact all kinds of bans on this, that, and the other thing, hold on here. You don't get a chance to be in the majority without us getting elected, and all of a sudden you're going to try to force us to take a vote on something that if we vote for it, we're going to get either primary or we're going to be defeated. Don't do this to us. So my role as leader is to try to figure out where, what's the sweet spot? What kind of reasonable gun safety bills can you pass and yet keep those people in those suburban areas able to get reelected? Sometimes... I was successful. Sometimes I wasn't. 
but I was never in been in the majority, so I never had total control over what bills actually got passed. And it seems to me that social media, if it were more active during your time here, would have made that even more difficult. Yeah, because it's so instantaneous. Somebody can hear something in a caucus meeting and then tweet it out to say, Toscano just said this, and what am I going to do? You know, I don't have enough time to respond. Uh, and what do they say? If you're explaining, you're losing. Uh, and and that happens a lot with social media. It, it becomes more of a negative force, even though theoretically it can be very positive because it allows you to communicate with more constituents faster and get more information to them. So it's a double-edged sword, uh, but, uh, you know, just we have to be mindful of how people interpret it. It was tough. I I, uh, I never have like social media, and uh, it it uh, I was saying earlier that when I first went into the office, I was uh, in the minority and freshman, and I might get eight or ten letters a week from people. And by the time I was getting ready to leave, I was getting probably 50, 60, 70 emails a day. A well, letter you have to write, you got to yeah. write a stamp, you but have to take some more effort. And and they were coming from literally all over the country. Well, my guess is that the all this extra interest in what you did, all these emails and letters that you got, that's actually political participation, right? That probably was not the, the worst sides of social media. It's not people wanting to weigh in on and advocate for different things. And social media can also be used as a weapon against politicians. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, I always found the worst part, what I thought was the worst part was, what, what they were saying didn't have to be true, and often wasn't. And how do you fight that? Mm. And, the, and they send out uh, 20,000 emails in your district saying that, that uh, you haven't paid your taxes in six years or something like that. And so, um, it can be very damaging. Well, the good news with AI is you'll be able to respond with artificial intelligence by, you know, to correct the yeah. error. I mean, you don't want to let things well, change the error. Change the error. <laughs> all right. Now, you have an alternative factor. So, man, I mean, you don't want to let something stay out there that, you know, is incorrect. It's, it's hard to correct it. Uh, but yeah, it is participation. And I would learn stuff from some of these letters that were well reasoned. The ones I didn't like were, were, were they called you a baby killer or something yeah. like that. Didn't bother to even talk about what the policy should be. The relationship that you have uh, as individuals, as colleagues, as, as fellow delegates when you served, do those relationships still exist across the aisle? Yeah, I think there is some. It still exists. I mean, one of the problems is because there's been a, such a rapid trend, uh, changeover in the House of Delegates where, you know, like uh, half the body hasn't even served four years. And so the relationships are not as strong. Well, we don't we don't know because we're not there. We don't know who these people are. But you got to think that it's, that's going to come around a little bit. I think some of the people who are not getting elected have backgrounds from local government or maybe they're attorneys or Maybe they're doing work that, uh, by its nature, people have to cooperate a little bit better, and they don't have a specific axe to grind, or they don't want to blow up the institution. Those people may be able to forge some bonds that will survive. But you, we just have to see. Uh, the, the national scene is so vitriolic and you know polarizing, and so much of it is percolating down the local, it's in the state. It is, it's our thing to fight, but we got to hope that people will stand up and say, yeah, we're going to do it a different way. Yeah. Are there things that people who are concerned about this nationalization of politics and, and, and the vitriol you described, David, what can we do? Well, I think the most important thing is for people to educate themselves about what, what really the truth is. That's try to seek out opposing points of view. I mean, oftentimes... People just get their information from one source. That doesn't help you all the time. You've got to look for other things. You've got to figure out who you can trust and then rely on them. You also have to you know, engage your uh, representatives. The good news about a state rep, you can ask them to go to coffee. Not during session, but you can do it when they're off session. You know, people have to drink coffee. They don't, I mean, have to drink coffee, but <laughs> they have to take breaks in their work day. They have to have lunch. You know, and they like doing that. So get together a couple of friends, take your legislator out to lunch and talk to them about 
what you think is important, get to know them, and then you'll have a contact. And yeah. once you have a contact, we will definitely look at that email. Yeah. And, and, I, and I do think um, what Bat School is doing, things like that are good for getting this next generation lined into uh, elected process. What do you want to say to the next generation? Someone who's interested in going into politics or interested in foreign policy. What advice would you give? Get in the game. You know, you, you, the, the, one of the cardinal rules of politics, decisions are made by those in the room at the time. If you're not in the room, it's hard to make a decision. You get in the room a lot of ways, I and mean, one way is just a vote. But it's not just that. It's you're just going to lunch, just getting together with a club or something that have uh, your delegate come to speak so you know what your delegate's thinking about stuff. Uh, it's, you know, writing a letter to the paper. It's, you know, reading as much as you can. It's putting your your yourself in somebody else's shoes to think about what they're thinking. So it's a whole host of things. The good news is you don't have to do it all. You can do some of it. And you're still participating. Hey, I, I would say the same thing. That participation is, is the opportunity to to get more involved, and there's plenty of opportunities. Uh, I suspect almost every locality in Virginia has a Republican committee and a, and a Democrat committee. Some are a lot more morbid than others, but uh, but you know they have they have regular meetings and uh, combined meetings with people and, and get involved and just say I'm interested in this. I think, I think that's a good one. And if someone gets in the game and they get elected and they're new delegates in the House, what advice would you have for a new delegate to be successful and to have both a rewarding, meaningful, but impactful career? Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, you, you want to talk to these people that, about how important it is to, to, to make uh, not partners or friends, but just community groups, once you get into the caucus, get to know everybody. Don't talk all the time. They just drive me crazy when people would get up and talk all the time. I had to call them down by name sometimes, but uh, um, they, um, uh, you, you set a lot of, of, of your tone during your first year or two. There, there are people that, that never lived off the things they said the first year. Uh, he just always went over there, go he goes again, that sort of thing. So it's uh, we we were talking about that earlier, and and um, both parties have mentorships sort of thing, which I think are really helpful, one on one um, type of situations where you can if they'll listen. Sometimes they don't want to listen. But, uh, I got a couple of things I'd say. One is listen, listen, listen to tolerate ambiguity. Uh, third, recognize that your worst adversary today can be your best friend tomorrow. Uh, and put yourself in other people's shoes and recognize that you're not the only one who knows everything and you need help to get stuff yeah. done. You got 10 more if you want, though. No, that comes later. That's, that's a great list, not just to do the elected members, I think it's a great list for leadership generally. Um, and leadership, I give you leadership that can help breach some of these divides. Um, you know, tolerating ambiguity, seeing political opponents not even as adversaries, but they're at their well, they look at adversaries, but not enemies. Right. Just, you, you can work with you, maybe become allies down the road for, for other challenges. And, and certainly putting yourself in other people's shoes has got to be one of the most important advice for learning how to coexist as a species together. Are you optimistic for this democracy? <laughs> Oh, for democracy, yes. I'm, 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 I'm a little concerned about the drift that the country seems to be in. I'm, I'm very concerned about the international situation. Uh, so it's, uh, I say my prayers every night when I go to bed. It's a, it's a scary time in a lot of ways. It's a challenging time, but I think the nature of people like us is we tend to be optimistic because we, we tend to think we can do stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's the only way that we, we, we can go about life. Now, you know, I'm a little sanguine about what's going on in the, in the world. And I'm worried about the nature of the Republic, depending on elections. 
but I just can't give up hope. If I give up hope, I might as well move to New Zealand. I don't want to do that. You know, and I, I think your point about how action is an antidote to feelings of yeah. despair, depression. Right? You can, even if we can't solve all the global issues, perhaps we can improve transportation infrastructure here. <laughs> perhaps we can improve quality of education. Perhaps we can actually demonstrably make people's lives better day by day. Mm -hmm. And I think progress is really all we can really hope for. You know, mm -hmm. solving all the problems may be too much. Well, I don't want to appear to be the uh, the pessimist in the crowd because I really do feel strongly about how we face far worse situations than this in the country over the years than we've always come through. And I, I keep thinking that come through effort to work again that uh, we'll turn it around. But uh, but they are they are uh, scary times. Mm -hmm. Um, give you each a final word, uh, your closing statement or an opening statement, but, but, but some, some final statement about, uh, hopefully inspiration for some of your lessons that you shared there about working with others, building bridges to people with whom you may disagree. What's your final word about that? Well, one of the things I am optimistic about is over the last four years or so, I think there's been a tremendous resurgence in discussions about civility, civil discourse, democracy. You see this group and this group and this, and they're institutionalized groups. I mean, they're in the bad school or Wisconsin has a, a, a study at the uh, state constitutions in our law school, or, or there's this group it was called braver angels or this or that. And there's so many more of them than there were when I was in office. And I think that's a reflection both of how people, how concerned people are about the future, but also this notion that they're going to change it. And it will all change at once, but hopefully if they do their work, then all of a sudden you'll notice that something is, is changing in the country. That's all I can hope for. A lot of good people doing good work. A lot of good people. Positive difference. Joe? Um, I, I would encourage people to get involved one way or the other. Then the, don't just let it be what, what's going on now. Um, we need some, some new thinkers in there, new people. Do. And I think that would be helpful. Um, I, I think you've got to do a lot of digging on your own. You can't just watch. Fox News or CNN and, and, and get all your news. I think you gotta dig deeper in that. Um, Delegate Delega Toscano's got a couple of books that you could buy and, and read. <laughs> Don't cut that up. <laughs> <laughs> At least two. All right. Yeah, two. So far. And he writes a lot. He, you, you stay quite involved. I tried to keep writing, partly because if I don't write it down, I'll forget it. So I better keep writing. Well, I am grateful to the two of you for your service to the Commonwealth, for your, your example of public service for students and generations that have followed you, for the contributions you've made to more civil discourse and to better policymaking through collaboration. Um, and I thank you for being part of the Batten School journey, for, for joining us for about an hour, for being on the grounds to listen. Thanks for having us. I really appreciate what y'all are doing. Appreciate my time in the legislature. Gosh, that was just such a blessing, the whole thing uh, that I was able to do. And meet people like David Toscano. It just wouldn't have happened otherwise, unless I had a DUI or something. <laughs> you had to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, no more DUIs. Um, but, but great to be with you both. Thank you, everybody, for joining Grounds to Listen with Bill Howell and David Toscano, um, two terrific Virginia leaders who've made a difference in your life, whether you've recognized it or not. Um, see you again. Thank, Thank you. you.